Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Quinney, and this is the Flames Face-Off brought to you by the Hockey Writers. Now, we're a weekly show where we bring some of the best writers we have in the Calgary Flames writing pool together, and we discuss all things Flames. Now, to be sure you don't miss an episode of this uh, program, you can uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel, uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, be sure to give us a like or two on YouTube and Facebook and share this uh, with your fellow Calgary Flames fans. Uh, now, in case you get tired of our strikingly handsome faces here, you can pick us up now as a podcast. And the easiest way to do that is just go to the Hockey Writers Podcast Network and uh, download us on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. So with that, let's get going. I'd like to introduce the panel um this week's a bit different we have a special guest uh matthew zader with us uh and matthew is a hockey writer's freelance writer uh, editor part-time journalist hockey scout and he lives and breathes all things vancouver canucks so we're gonna have to uh cut him some slack on that one uh, <laughs> matthew we won't play that up too much but um He's uh, Matthew's our uh, resident expert on the draft, uh, a real student of the younger players of the game. And he also authors our uh, highly regarded, widely read uh, NHL draft every year. So we're delighted that he's with us today because we're going to talk about how the Calgary Flames did in the draft. And uh, rounding out our panel this week, of course, is Mr. Brett Krause. Brett, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Paul. I'm excited to talk today. It's been a busy week for the Flames. So good. And Greg Tuzowski, welcome, Greg. Good to be here. Um, I'm also excited. You know, like in the off season, we sometimes struggle to fill this uh, half an hour with like talking about you know what ifs. Well, now we have some what happens stuff to talk about. So I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to having uh, Matthew with us today. Um, I guess the Flames would be what? Your second uh, favorite team in the league? <laughs> Far from it. <laughs> uh, uh oh, don't dig yourself a hole here. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Um, well, Matthew, uh, again, it's good to have you here. And, and, but before we get into the, the nitty gritty of you know, what happened in the draft this weekend, um, I'd like you to just stand back for a bit and put your philosopher's hat on and uh, give us your take on the importance of the draft as a means through which to build the team. Um, I know, you know, I wrote an article on Calgary's history with the draft over a 20 year period. And what I found was that less, and you would know this, uh, less than half the players they drafted ever set foot in an NHL rink and only 20% of the players they drafted ever played uh, more than 100 games in the league. 5% uh, of the people they drafted uh, only played uh, more than 300 games in a flame in a flames uniform and uh, very few players that they took ever played more than a thousand games. Um, so, you know, what's your take is the entry draft, um, as it is really as interesting as it is, it, is it really much to do about nothing? Well, I mean, the draft, I think is a starting point. I mean, you look at, you look at how many players, like you said, how many players have made it into the NHL from the draft. You look back, not just for the flames or for any team, the first two rounds are basically ones where you kind of get some surefire NHL. There's a lot of them make it to the NHL. The first round in particular are the ones that kind of, they're the guys that'll make it. They may not make it as the goal scores they were touted out at to be, but they definitely turn into NHL players, be it a third, fourth line guy, a character guy, um, you know, less stuff like that. But you look at the history in the league, when you get down to the later rounds is where you kind of, that's where the scouting gets put into the spotlight, you know, guys that kind of, you can pick out different things. But like your question is, I, you know, Player development, I think, is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the drafts to start, once they're into the organization, that's when the real work begins. You look at how many guys thrive in certain environments, and then they go to another, another team, and all of a sudden they're not doing well. Or the other way around, they're struggling in an organization, they get traded, and all of a sudden they're, 
starting to figure it out. And it depends on coaching. It depends on, uh, you know, the guys that they're around, some of the leaders that they get to deal with mentoring them. And I think there's a, just a whole bunch of stuff that goes into a successful NHL player. It's not just, well, I'm drafted fifth overall. Well, I'm going to be successful. I, that's not always not the case, but I'd say, like I said, I think the draft's just that starting point, And then the real work begins for all, everyone that's in the organization. Yeah. Right. Uh, Brett, could comment on that, please? Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on the draft as a tool by which to build a team relative to, as Matthew points out, player development, UFAs, signings, good old fashioned trades? What's your take? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, a, a good take. Um, I think there's just a lot of moving parts in a, you know, in, in any sports, team sports organization. Um, so I think, yeah, the draft is a good starting point. Um, I think you look at a lot of Stanley Cup winners and yes, they have, you know, top five picks that went on to be superstars, which does help your team. Um, but I also think it's, you know, it's finding guys like Andrew Mangiapane in the the sixth round and finding those kind of guys too that, you know, and uh, as Matthew said, to, to develop those players, which Mangiapane did, he's, and he's developed into a very good NHLer. So, uh, yeah, I think there's just a, it's a lot of moving parts that equal that, you know, that success for one NHL player um, and franchise. Yeah. Hey, Greg, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, given that uh, Giordano, our former captain, and Chris Tanev were never drafted, what, how do you view the draft, the entry draft? Well, the way I see it is the draft is a big deal because every, I don't know, 10, 12 years, there is a generational player, you know, and, uh, you know, most recently, like McDavid, and before him, Crosby, before him, like Lemieux. I remember all of these drafts because I'm, I'm old enough even to remember Mario being drafted and uh, it's this excitement of the generational players that keeps things going, you know, that, uh, that keeps, you know, all of the hype, all of that drives everything because this was kind of a no real big star kind of draft because it was kind of a weird year. And uh, I found the hype wasn't really there. I think the consensus number one kept changing, you know, over the last few months. And uh, so this is, this was kind of an off year, but I think that the draft remains in the headlines and people get excited for it for, for that next generational player. And it, and there is, um, from what they say, uh, some some kid playing in the W right now who might be the next guy in a couple of years. And uh, so, and and that's what keeps people excited about the draft. But I think I, I agree with uh, with you, Paul. And in in the sense is that a, a lot of times it's much ado about nothing. And there's uh, and there's never and and unless you get one of these big generational players coming out of the draft, it can kind of be, you know, uh, kind of a boring kind of thing. Like this year, I don't really know if there's any kind of surefire players who are, are, are going to make a roster in the fall. Does anyone think that? I'm, I'm not sure. So, so. Yeah. No. Well, Matthew, yeah, but pine in on that. Cause I know, you know, this, was this a tough year for you to predict? Uh... It, it was insane. Like I thought I had my rankings pretty good of what, where guys would go. And now I'm looking back and it, it looks all over the place. Like there's just so many guys that got drafted in weird spots um dropping into the third fourth rounds when they should have been in the first or even in early second uh dylan duke's a perfect example of that he went down further down than i ever thought he would and uh there's some guys that are like well who the heck is this guy and it's just the scouting staff so there's guys that these teams are just they trust their scouts they got scouts in you know in russia and europe i uh, that just know these guys and they they just leaned i think a lot on that this year and to, to your point about guys that are not going to make uh, the roster in the fall, I don't think any of them will. Um, hmm. Owen Powers going back to school. We already kind of know that. Uh, Matt Beniers will probably be going back to Michigan as well. Um, you, you know, there's maybe some talk that William Eklund may try to make the Sharks, but I don't think there's a lot, there's any surefire that can be playing in the NHL and actually make an impact, so... Right, right. Well, you know, that's a good segue into uh, next topic is uh, Coronado, uh, Calgary's um, <clears throat> first number one draft pick um, from the U.S. Uh, Hockey League. He went 13th overall. Uh, Matthew, what's the skinny on this kid? Uh, give us your take. Should we be happy with the, with the choice? I, I absolutely love this guy. I am um, not just because he has the same name as me. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I followed him. I did his draft profile at, on the hot writers here too. So 
I know a lot about him. I did. I watched video, a lot of video on the guy and he's, he's just a pure goal scorer. He just knows where to go. He may not be the fastest guy, but he does, he knows where the scoring spots are, where you go, where you can go to actually to score goals. And when he, when he makes the NHL and in his prime, he's going to be, I'm going to predict he's going to be a 30 goal scorer. And mm. that's just how I, how good he is. And like I said, he's not that flashy guy that you're going to be like, Oh, get out of your seat. He's going to go, he's going to be just a goal scorer. And that's, I'm really happy with not happy that the flames picked him because I, I have to deal with him in Vancouver here, but he's going to be a hell of a player. He, he does everything. I think, well, uh, he can kill penalties. He can play the power play. I, He's 5'10", he maybe is, you know, what, quote-unquote, undersized, but I don't feel like he's going to have that problem. I think he's just too smart of a player to be able to get into those goal-scoring spots. So I think the Flames did hit a home run getting him uh, in the first round there. Yeah. Brett, uh, would you concur with that? What's your take on Coronado? Yeah, um, I really liked it. I liked the pick um, just from reading, you know, mock drafts. It seemed like Cole Sillinger was kind of the consensus that was going to be going to the Flames, but then he was taken uh, one spot before. But um, I really liked it. As soon as they made the pick, I wasn't really sure where they were going to go. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of a pure offensive guy. And, you know, I think that's something the Flames will need down the line. If And, yeah, like Matthew said, if he's going to be a 30-goal scorer, that's kind of the guy the Flames are going to need here in about two years if he's, you know, if he's potentially able to make the roster by then. But, I mean, 43 or some goals in 51 games, like, that's pretty good. So I'm excited to see what what he can kind of do here in the next two seasons. Yeah. Greg, your thoughts on him? Uh, Matthew used the term or the phrase when he makes the NFL, NHL. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you like him? And when's that going to be? How long will it take for him to – Kind of percolate. Well, he's he's committed to go to Harvard uh, University in the fall, and um, and but you know, I, I was reading some of the Flames boards, and some of the fans were kind of mad. It's like, oh, this is great, but we have another small guy. He's like an inch taller than Goudreau at five ten. But you know, I was I did some research on him because I just published a, a piece on him this morning, and uh, the guy is he's a solid five ten. Like he's only at eighteen years old. He's already one hundred eighty three pounds. And that's 10 pounds heavier than the Flames second round pick, William Stromgren, who is 6'3. And so this kid is, you know, and he's only 18, so he'll only get bigger and stronger at this point. Awesome. So I think he, I think his 5'10, you know, people say, oh, that's like Manjapani. But like, you know, he seems to be a pretty uh, solid guy. Like his nickname is the Bison, is what they called him uh, down at the, for the Chicago Steel, the, the TV play play by play guy, because he could go to the hard areas and he kind of just rams towards the net. So I, I think he's he, he's going to play bigger than his undersized, you know, uh, stature. And so I'm I'm happy with this pick. It's funny because we didn't talk about this guy a couple of weeks ago. I think we talked about yeah. Chaz, Lucius, and you know Mason McDonald, and you know Sillinger. We had talked about. We never really talked about this guy. So I kind of when when they picked him, I kind of started reading up on him. I was like, wow, he's. Uh, I think he might be the real deal. I think I agree with Matthew on this one, and uh, you know he could definitely be. You know, in two years, maybe, maybe two years of seasoning and maybe he makes the Flames roster. Who knows? Like, uh, I don't mm-hmm. think he's going to stay his full four years. He said he hasn't committed to like a full four year stint at Harvard. So I bet you he's playing, you know, two years from now. That's my that's my bold prediction. Yeah. OK, well, we're going to see uh, in time. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We were talking about Chaz Lucius. I love that name. Sounds like a movie <laughs> star. You know, not a hockey player, but, yeah. yeah. But um, anyway, let's get to the meat of this thing. Uh, let's uh, second guess Flames general manager Brad for living. Uh, uh, I think it, as one of you guys pointed out, the consensus pick might have been you, Matthew, was was Cole Sillinger, but he was picked by the Columbus Blue Jackets and 12th spot. And then by the time 13th came around, um, we, however, did have um, Chaz Lucius, uh, Corson Coleman's, uh, Fabian Lysel, Jesper Volstead, if I've got that correct in my Swedish accent, uh, Carson Lambos, and Sebastian Kosa. Um, they were highly regarded as picks, uh, as, as was Coronado. But uh, 
why not one of them? What's your take on that, um, Matthew, given, uh, given what the Flames maybe needed versus what they picked in Coronado? For like for needs, I mean, Jacob Markstrom's not the youngest goaltender anymore. I, behind him, there's not really a ton of surefire, you know, starters. So I mean, yeah, they could have it could have used Wallstead or Kosa um, to for that. But I mean, they also need goal scoring. And you look at Goudreau's kind of regressing. I mean, he's still a dangerous player in the NHL, but he is seems to be regressing in his scoring. Um, sure for our goal scores, they don't really have a lot of them. Um, I would have been happy the flames picking Lucius as well. And I mean, defensemen like Coleman's and uh, Coleman's would have been a good pick. I think Coleman's going here would be a little bit high in my opinion. Um, I mean, I rated Coronado to go 11th and everyone was all over me when I've had him 10th, actually in my first rankings. Right. And, uh, it feels like oh, he's a little, that's quite high for him. And I'm like, eh, I think he's going that high. Look at where he went. 13th sure. or 12th if you take away that stupid Arizona pick <laughs> so it's uh <laughs> so yeah I, I think I think they made the right decision in getting Coronado but yeah they could have definitely gone in those directions and I would have been uh grading them in the same way so yeah uh Brett any second guess picks here you want to throw out uh... <clears throat> um yeah I, I think probably Coronado at that spot was good um, when Sillinger went, I kind of wondered if maybe the Flames traded down, kind of like they did for Connor Zary last uh, draft. Um, they didn't end up doing that, but I think kind of any of those guys you mentioned, I would have rather have seen like a trade down scenario because um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, some of those guys, except maybe for Wallstead, I would have been, you know, I think I would have liked that pick too because you know, everybody seems to think he's supposed to be the, uh, a surefire to make it the NHL. Mm -hmm. So I think that would have been a good pick there too. But um, overall, I'm happy. I think the Flames did go with, you know, best player available at that point. Hmm. That's interesting. Both you and Matthew mentioned Walsh that uh, goaltenders scare me. There's there's <laughs> such a, a crapshoot. Um, Greg, would what's your take on that? Would you have... Uh, Foregone Coronado for Wallstead or somebody else? What's your take? No, I know. I think you know. Everyone's been talking about how Flames needs help on the right, right-handed shot on the right side. You know, and uh, I know Coronado is not going to be an immediate fix because he's not NHL ready, but um, it is addressing a need that they needed. I think so. I think that was it was so in that regard. I kind of like the pick and like goalies. You know, it's funny because. Um, Dustin Wolf was like a final round pick for the Flames. I think he was the last guy standing in that rink a couple of years ago. And it was a, uh, I felt kind of bad for him. He was just waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, finally the Flames picked him. And, you know, he was a late, late round goalie pick. And, you know, he could be the goalie of the future for the Flames. Like he is, he is, he's coming off, you know, I think goalie of the year at, on, at the WHL. And uh, so I don't really know if, if they really needed another goalie in their system with kind of, kind of Wolf might be their, their young guy that they're, kind of grooming for a couple of years down the road. So, you know, I'm actually happy with this item. You know, like there were a, a lot of guys available who we talked about in the, in the, in the weeks leading up to the draft that um, in the end, I think um, I'm not second guessing Trey Living. I think he got a really good pick, you know, and he didn't trade up, trade down. He just stuck, stuck with his pick, which I, I think was, I was uh, hoping he would do. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm giving him a thumbs up for the first round pick for sure. Yeah. Um, well, on that, uh the draft pick position were, were any of you guys surprised to see him simply pick at 13th? Uh, their lot, their lottery designated spot. Um, he, he didn't try to deal his way up or down. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Matthew, would that have been in order this year, given the uncertainty around the players that were available? Well, I mean, you saw some big trades with first round picks this year, and I, that seems to be the first year that that's really happened where big, where high picks have kind of gone on draft day. Like Canucks tra traded theirs. Uh, Nashville got another one uh, in the, in the first round Buffalo traded theirs. It, it's like, it, it's an interesting, it, it's interesting of how, how many pick how many did actually happen, but I think the flames kind of, 
I think they probably thought that Coronado wouldn't have dropped any further. I, I was, like I said, I had him 11th. I think he was going to go around that point. If they would have traded down, I think they would have missed out. I think another team would have picked him beforehand. So, I mean, I think staying there was the right choice if Coronado was their guy uh, to pick. Yeah. Brett, what's your take? Was just sticking with 13th the right uh, choice here? I mean, Trelevin has made a few uh, uh, moves up and down in, in the past, but not this year. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think, you know, the Flames are kind of at a point where they can make the playoffs, but I think they also need to continue building their prospect pipeline because it's, you know, not that great. They have some good prospects. Um, so they, I think they, it's always good to keep adding to it. Uh, I had kind of hypothesized them doing what Vancouver ended up actually doing, which was getting Potter Garland um, out of Arizona, but I'm not sure Flames would have done it with Ekman Larson. I just don't know if they would have had the money to do it because um, I know the Flames are once again looking for a right winger in the, or right shot in the top six, so that would have <clears throat> fit the bill. But, um, yeah, I think it was probably just best to stay put and make a, a good selection, which I think they got best player available and you know it fit a need of a right winger right shot yeah well you know that's an interesting point greg uh you know true levings on record as saying he doesn't draft by position he drafts by the best player uh did he do that in this case i think so like uh yeah. i think he did exactly <laughs> that um i think GMs have their list of who might be available and uh, when their turn comes up. And uh, at 13, maybe they didn't get who their, their first pick was. Everyone's talking about Sillinger. But I think when, you know, Coronado's name, you know, still available, I think it was it was a no-brainer. You know, like uh, I agree with Matthew that this kid has this huge upside. And he's, you know, uh, I was reading up on him and um, the, the TSN analysts were calling him the best pure goal scorer in the in the draft and so and, and that's and that's pretty heady stuff like that's uh you don't say that kind of stuff lightly you know like so i think he's uh he's the real deal and i, I didn't think it was I, I think it was a good idea to just stand pat because i was reading up on some of the uh some of the prospects and like matthew's right like there was there were some guys who some people had you know in the top 10 and others had him like at 48 like it was just all hmm. over the place and so like it's hard to this is a weird draft and i think it would be the kind of draft where you would want to stay put maybe be, and not make, because there's no surefire guys here. There's, there's a lot of questions and a lot of ifs and what, you know, so I, know, I think uh, it, it was the right move to stay pat and I, I like the pick. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with this, uh, with, with the first round for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Matthew, that's an interesting question. You were, you, Greg's uh, touched on this and, and you uh, were mentioning this, the, the, kind of the disparity between the uh, writers on who belong where and what position in the draft. You got any theories on uh, why there was such a difference uh, among uh, you draft experts? As to well, the, the biggest thing is, is the lack of viewings. I mean, for mm. us, we're limited to what we can do. Like the video that's out there, um ourselves if we were in the area we couldn't go to games because there's games that like the ohl was completely shut down all year there was guys picked that never played a game this year and the scouts were just looking at what they did last year maybe got some inside information on how they were training what type of size they were gaining um i heard some people kind of saw them in practice rinks and saw them practicing but i mean in-game situations is just so huge to watch these guys actually playing competitive hockey, being on the bench, talking to the guy, you know, talking to their teammates. What do they do in the dressing room? Do you get reports from this when they're playing, but when they're not, how do you, how do you know? Um, yeah. The only leagues that were really playing like the USHL was very lucky. You saw a lot of guys. That's why Coronado stood out as being one of the better players because the USHL played an entire season without much problems. So, I mean, you saw that a lot of, I think the USHL came out of this draft as taking on a little bit more of a quality, you know, that they're actually a league that you can get really good players out of. I think that's going to start becoming something later on. A lot of more scouts are going to be looking at that league. 
Mm. They're not a weak league anymore, I don't think. And the Chicago Steel in general, they how many guys got picked from that team this year? Um, this wasn't just this year. Last year, there was a few. Owen Power was playing with the Chicago Steel before he went to Michigan. It's, it's a, a quality system. I think that's where the disparity comes up because there's so many different leagues that some were doing it stronger. You saw more of them. Europe didn't really get shut down a lot. So you, you saw a lot of Europeans like the Canucks in general drafted a lot of Euro European players because they have so many scouts out there. Right. So it's, it's, I think that's where the, where it kind of comes in is that there's just so much that people couldn't see. They were just relying on their scouts and we, we can't, we don't have, we're not privy to that information. So I think that's mm. where we're just looking at video. We think, Oh yeah, they look good. So we rate them a, above other guys. And I think that's where it comes from. Drafting players that you can't see. This could have been my year. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, damn. Um, let's switch gears though, Matthew. Um, can you say something about the second and third picks? Uh, do we know much about them? Anything stand out there for you? I like the pick Will and Stromgren. I actually liked him for the Canucks in the second round as well. I, of course, he's a, he's a Swede, so the Canucks would be all over him anyway. Um, but for Calgary, they got actually a really good pick here. I mean, a lot. there were a few. He kind of got drafted in this place that a lot of rankings were setting him to be. I had him a little, ranked a little lower in my final rankings. I had him at uh, in like the 50s or 59th overall. But uh, his skill level, he's a bulldog. He kind of he he plays that great four checking game. I think he really fits what the Calgary Flames play that type of style. I think he's going to play a, a big role in the, in the Flames' future later on. And just bulks out. He's six three, like we mentioned his weight a little earlier. And I think once he kind of fills into that six three frame, he's going to be a really hard player to play against. So I like yeah. that pick. Hey, Greg, you mentioned strong, strong grin as well. What, uh, what stands out? Um, from what I've been reading about him, uh, he's, I guess he's a speedy winger. He's got great hands. Uh, I was, I was reading something about, he can get himself into dangerous positions. Um, but, uh, I guess he, he needs, uh, to be more consistent on defensive positioning and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think, Size, you know, matters still in this league. Like he's a big guy, you know, he does need to fill out because he's probably only 173 pounds right now. So, um, but yeah, but that's the thing. He, uh, he, he, he probably needs two or three years of, you know, mm. seasoning as they say before he can uh, try, yeah. try for a roster spot. But uh, I, I like the move. I think he's a, uh, I think the, the flames need to get a bit bigger because, you know, they, they, they have a fair bit of small guys on their team. They have the last several years with, uh, with guys that, you know, Dylan Dubé is not a big guy and Derek Ryan who's been playing with them for several years has not a big guy. Manjapani, Goudreau, of course. So to see a six, three guy coming down the pipe, I think is a, is, is a welcome change for this team. Yeah. Hey, Matthew, just going to the third pick, uh, they selected Huckins, a center and uh why not a defenseman? Any, uh, any word on them? Any, do you know anything about them? Well, I mean, Cole Huckins is that power forward type guys. Again, size, he's a bigger guy. He plays that power forward type game. So again, a flames type of pick and how they play. And I think he, again, is going to be a few years down the road. Like a lot of these guys, they're not going to make that impact right away. Uh, he'll have a few more years in the queue. And I think that's a good pick too, just by again, size. And he's been compared uh, Craig Eagles at QMJHL.ca, he compared him to Joe Thornton, which is a, a pretty big uh, comparison <laughs> at, yeah. at times. I mean, that doesn't always mean he's going to play that way, but just being compared to a guy like Thornton, that's that's pretty heady company. So um, Hawkins, I like that pick, big centerman. Uh, Cameron, why not? I've always liked this this defenseman. He, apart from his name, he's a great name. Why not? Why not pick yeah. him? <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, why, why not? not? I can't yeah. Um, but he, he's a great puck moving defenseman, that type of defenseman that you need in the NHL. Now you, you can't get through with just that type of size, you know, with just size and being a lumbering type guy, like a, like a good Branson where he got drafted second overall for some reason way back when. Um, but yeah, you need to be mobile and he's one of those guys that can get the puck up the ice and to guys that can put the puck in that. I, I really like that pick as well. Yeah. 
Brett, any thoughts on your from you on Strombrin, uh, Huckins, and Wynets? Uh, anything stand out for you there? Um, yeah, I didn't. I hadn't really uh, heard too much about uh, any of them. Really, kind of the second round there, I was kind of looking at some um, other guys, but I uh, found here on Twitter from Michael Holm. He says Stromgen is a, a large, incredibly skilled player that finds open split space really well in the offensive zone. Stuff to work on, but his if his consistency keeps up, he's got top twenty upside. So, I mean, that's pretty exciting uh, to kind of hear that if, a, you know, a guy like that can figure it out that, you know, he might be a really good player for the Flames. Um, yeah. And then I saw a comparison with Why Not was uh, Jeremy Poirier, who uh, the Flames drafted last year. I saw somebody make that comparison, just kind of similar styles. Um, just switching back to um, uh, Matthew, uh, any thoughts on who they chose in the fourth to seventh? I know, you know, once you get beyond the third round, it, it gets tough, but, uh, yeah. does anything leap out at you there? I like the one guy I really like the Cole Jordan, uh, pick. I had him rated in the third, I believe it was the third round in my uh, final rankings. And it, I was really surprised he dropped to the fifth round because just because mm. of his, his skating ability and his size, I mean, you get a guy that's six, two, six, three, that can skate and can skate really well. Cole Jordan just fits that. And I don't understand why he dropped so far, yeah. but I mean, looking at, he's playing in the WHL, which didn't get going until later on in the season and maybe didn't get enough, enough to kind of uh, sway, sway teams to get him. But I just don't understand why he dropped so far being, you know, I don't know what, what kind of part of his attributes that would drop him, but Flames got a steal down there. I think he's going to be a heck of a defenseman when he makes the NHL. Uh, mm-hmm. Other than that, I mean, Sergey Serg- 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 the d- goaltender. I mean, goaltenders. This is where you draft them in that later rounds. I mean, if they hit, they hit. They don't. You know, it's not really the seventh round. Is your percentages are quite low if they're going to make the NHL. But if they do, it's it's big. Uh, Jack Beck is another guy I haven't really seen a lot of. Again, OHL guy. Yeah. Didn't play at all this season. Uh, just going by what what was last thing, we did have a profile on him uh, that Frankie did, and he had some good things to say about him. So I, I trust his judgment. He's really plugged into the OHL stuff. So uh, I think Beck could still become something in a later round. And again, this is where you pick these guys, low risk, high reward. So. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised you, you didn't say more, uh, Matthew, about uh, that goaltender, Sergeev. Uh, he played with the uh, the Shreveport Mud Bags. Oh, yeah, they're that, that, of the that North team. American <laughs> <laughs> Hockey League. I gotta look that up. I gotta look at the history. The Mud Bags might be a marketing problem, uh, somewhere in the organization. That's uh, a great name. I love that name, all timer. <laughs> but, uh, Greg, uh, your thoughts on four to seven? Anything leap out at you there? Um, well, yeah, I um, I agree that uh, Cole Jordan is, might have been a big steal because uh, I was kind of checking him out after the fact as well. And they had they said elite prospects had him ranked as 36, and then you know FC Hockey had him 64. So like the fact that the Flames got him in these later rounds, I think that's a pretty good deal for the Flames. And uh, um, from what I can see in this guy, he's um, he's got good skating ability and hockey IQ and. Uh, you know, like he's not flashy, but he's effective, I guess, and uh, quick on his feet. So, you know, I think uh, he could be a good a, a good addition again, you know, like two or three years that down the pipe. Or we had talked earlier in the show about how these later picks, you know, like after the first and second round, you know, like what are the percentage of guys making it? to the NHL from like five, five, six, seven, eight rounds. So, so, but the fact that he was ranked higher by, you know, a, a lot of these uh, ranking services before, be, before the draft, I think he's probably the best steal of the draft for, for the flames. That's yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, uh, with, with Jordan. Brett, finally word to you, uh, draft picks four to seven, anything leap out? Um, yeah, just from kind of seeing the, 
Twitter scouts of the world, they were big on Cole Jordan and uh, the few highlights I saw on the Flames page, you know, he looks like a big man who can move on the back end. So that's always a, a good prospect to have. And we'll see where he's at after another, you know, two seasons in the WHL when he's ready to go pro. But um, other than that, yeah, the Jack Beck pick don't know too much about. Um, and then the, actually the goalie pick in the seventh round, like it, it was the North American hockey league, which is under the USHL, I believe. Um, but he put up a 936 in like 20 or 20, 20 so games. So that's not nothing for sure. And he, he's committed to um, Connecticut, I think. So yeah, it's a, you know, kind of taking a pick on a, a goalie in a unknown league. So it's uh, not a bad, not a bad idea in the seventh round. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but that was a great discussion. And I'd really like to thank uh, Matthew Zader for joining us this week. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Matthew. Really enjoyed the discussion. And for all you folks out there who may be wondering uh, what your team got in the NHL uh, entry draft this weekend, what you've got to do is check out Matthew's, uh, the Hockey Redders uh, NHL draft guide it's indispensable widely read uh very credible um and i'd like to thank uh everyone for joining us and uh, we'll be back in two weeks time with another edition of the flames face off um and in the meantime though uh be sure to subscribe give us a like and share this with your fellow flames fans and be sure to check out some of the great content that we have here at thehockeywriters.com. Thanks again. Take care.